Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to RevBytes uh, with your host, Doug Truitt, Head of Revenue Success at Reynolds United, and myself, John DeRolay, Revenue Management Expert at Wheelhouse. Uh, and we're going to be having 20 to 30 minute conversations about topics in revenue and distribution in the revenue or the STR and vacation rental spaces. So we're really excited for you to listen. Um, and uh, welcome to our first episode. Today, we're going to be talking about the uh, um, acronym Avalanche. What KPIs should I be looking at? <laughs> um, so say hi, Doug. Hey, guys. Nice to meet everybody. Uh, yep. Happy to be here. Happy to be a favorite part of this. This is actually going to be really fun. I'm excited. Yeah, and we uh, we have a, a slide up, but we won't be having visual content on these, day these so you can just kind of throw them on and listen if you're interested. So uh, let's go ahead and just get started. And um, Doug, uh, I want to ask you, you know, there's a lot of... Um, a lot of KPIs to look at. People are always throwing down new uh, acronyms, um, but you know, at the core of it, you know, RevPAR, ADR, occupancy. What's the most important thing we should be looking at? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I talk with a lot of clients at Reynolds United, um, and, and you know, there's there's so many different walks of life within the the vacation rental space. You know, I mean, there's there's so many people. I mean, there's there's full big enterprise companies. You know. You know, three, four hundred plus properties in. You know, there's smaller SMB property companies. There's you know vacation destinations. There's urban. There's all kinds of things. And and I think I think the style and the the um, type of branding and type of marketing that a that a company is going for dictates the importance of certain metrics within revenue management. From what I've what I've been kind of kind of learning from some of these clients, because uh, my background is pretty isolated from hotels and then also from, you know, one specific type of vacation rental company, which was all urban downtown locations. So I think for me, like, you know, what I'm picking up on recently is, you know, the, the traditional historical, you know, thought of this is what happened in the past to dictate what you do in the future from, from a KPI standpoint is kind of lost. I think things are more reactive right now. And I think what I'm hearing a lot more, from people is about ADRs, um, and, and I'm hearing more, more regards to like you know what is the ADRs that are coming in um, versus the the occupancy is there. Revpar is interesting, but I think it's kind of lost its relevancy. Kind of you know, you know, uh, during pandemic, post pandemic, kind of like this new sense of normalcy is defining itself. So I think that the KPIs are really tough. I think people are looking more towards like. Um, you know, ADR and occupancy is what I would, what I would say. How about you? What have you, what have you kind of been feeling? Oh man, it's first episode and I've, you know, we're two minutes in and I've already got to disagree with you, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I think, you know, I think um, there's kind of two parts to this. The first thing is I think RevPAR is king um, because you know, for those who don't know what RevPAR is, RevPAR is your revenue divided by the number of total available days you would have had. Most of us are going to take the revenue and divide it by the number of days in the month. So it's a metric that allows you to compare um, your performance, your real performance. How much money am I making? And not only do that, but compare it across uh, different aspects of your portfolio because the time dimension is going to be locked. You can use it to compare um, three bedrooms to two bedrooms. You can use it to compare markets to markets. You can use it to compare date ranges to date ranges. Now, there is a significant problem with RevPAR. RevPAR, I think, is king, but it's, it's a backward-looking metric. You can't use it when you're trying to make decisions about the future. And I think what we have to understand about the ecosystem of all three of these metrics, ADR being the rate you're charging or have charged uh, average rate you charge on a given day and occupancy being how much you've booked is um, RevPAR really is ADR and occupancy together. So when you're looking in the future, you can't use RevPAR. You have to judge um, what your rate position is and what you're actualizing against your your occupancy and really more specifically than occupancy, your booking velocity, which is we're, we're going to throw another one out there. We don't have a, a an acronym for it yet. BV, <laughs> you got to check your BV. <laughs> check your BV. Yeah. Sounds like a, sounds like an Ovaltine product or something. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And actually I think, I think we're, we're talking similar, similar aspects in there because I think what I've been hearing a lot from clients and my, my relevant experience recently has been that, you know, 
historical and looking backwards is really tough uh, to actually make decisions on how they go forward. And so it's become more of a reactive modeling kind of place where people are uh, needing to probably start, you know, getting a little more risky and do some A-B testing and see what works and what doesn't work. And I think you hit on a great point, which is booking velocity. Um, you know, at, at Reynolds United, you know, being head of revenue success, I created a product called Data Studio for our clients. And one of the me metrics I created in there is called bookings per unit. And basically it's a way for our clients to look at like how, how frequently is a unit getting booked? How much conversion is it actually getting? And using that as an indicator to say, maybe I'm priced too high, maybe I'm priced too low as a reactive modeling for the future kind of incoming nature of things. And so I think booking velocity is definitely key. You got to see how many, how many fish are biting on, on the bait you're throwing out there when you're fishing, basically, right? What are people, what, when you have people look at booking velocity, what are they using as the baseline to compare that to? Because you, you know, it's, what you're saying is it's kind of like a temperature gauge, right? But how do you mm -hmm. know... How do you know if you're too hot or too low when you're looking at that metric? Yeah, I think, I think, I, I mean, I might sound like I'm contradicting myself a little bit, but we do show it compared to prior year in the same ISO week of creation date of a bookings um, with regards to like the velocity on the units. And, you know, it's a, it's an interesting thing to look at as a comparison. I mean, you can look at it back in pandemic timeframe and say, wow, pandemic was terrible. Like velocity should have been way down. Um, and you would, you would think that now that vaccines are rolling out and things are happening, velocity should be up. And if it's a strong indicator that is up great, but, um, that's kind of the, the position to look at it. Plus we're also actively trying to figure out a benchmarking level for some of our customers to actually say, you probably should be booking, you know, this type of velocity in the future. And you're missing out because you're maybe your price too high. Um, also, you know, using relative market comparison data to show what's what's kind of publicly advertised in the market or what's converting in the market compared to what you're doing can also influence within that velocity of what you're getting to, to from a conversion standpoint. Absolutely. Let's uh, let's come back to booking velocity. I have some thoughts on it. Um, but I do want to roll back to kind of like ADR and occupancy. Do you think, you know, because they're all, all the, the thing to keep in mind for everyone is all of these data points are related. You know, we talk about them and what's more important, but they really are all related. But, you know, for, for people who are dealing with um, COVID or just building a strategy right now, do you think they should, you know, be driving either should or are? Uh, trying to drive ADR or occupancy? And what do you think are the, the pros and cons of, of either one? Um, you know, I can I kind of will go back to what I originally said with regards to like styles and markets and locations. I mean, you know, your urban downtown locations, um, I feel like are, are driving more occupancy related uh, decisions because they're having the demand is not as as heavy in the urban downtown locations yet um, as it is in the kind of surf and ski or you know, destinations. I mean, Florida is super hot right now. Um, and, and it's just going, going crazy, like gangbusters, just bookings, crazy high ADR stuff that, that hasn't been seen booking windows are way longer, you know, things like that. But in the urban downtown locations, it's not as much, you know, higher ADRs are starting to creep up. I mean, so I think, I think it depends on your strategy for what type of, you know, uh, product you have and where you're located at that dictates, kind of what your focus is, whether it's ADR or occupancy. I mean, at the end of the day, when everybody gets into the short windowed uh, time frame in the booking window, people go for occupancy all, all day, every day, because, it, you know, they'd rather have some heads and beds than none um, to a certain degree. I mean, some some companies definitely have owners to to consider with regards to, you know, rev share and that kind of stuff. So it may impede the ability to short sell um, in, in the short term or trash the rates, uh, kind of, so to speak, to get the occupancy. But yeah. No, I hear you. I talked to a lot of people about um, ADR versus occupancy and, you know, both you and I cut our teeth in the in the lease arbitrage model. So we yeah, tended we to, you know, ADR is a lot about risk management, right? You're, you know, you're trying to get that that extra bit and put yourself in the top 10 percent uh, percentile of the market for, for your product. But, you know, you're taking the risk that you get nothing or you get cut rate at the bottom. And, mm -hmm. you know, for people who really have dealt with large portfolios, particularly of similar listings, um, you, you're able to extrapolate 
what's going on in order to build your ADR. So you give a little bit away at the beginning in order to get an idea of where you're going. Not everyone has that luxury and you have to take risks um, around it. I think for people who maybe are a little less experienced on, you know, talking about ADR occupancy or maybe talking to investors who are really focused on one or the other, the thing to remember is that, you know, with ADR, um, and it all this all ties back to the rev par. With ADR, you can, you know, you can have a really great ADR, but if your occupancy is really low, you're really not making any money. And the opposite is true too. If you sell $99 a night, you might have 100% occupancy, but if you look at the marketplace, everyone else might've been selling at $400 a night at 89% occupancy, in which case your rev par is way below. So understanding that balance for you, how do you think people should, um, you know, what other factors should be considered when they're trying to figure out if they're really trying to push rate right through ADR or ensure, you know, rev par through occupancy? Yeah, I think I mean, two points. One, I'll answer that question in a second, but I wanted to hit on something you said too with regards to RevPAR. I mean, like you, you had said before, it's a very good backward looking tool. Um, it can be a forward looking tool, but the problem is predicting and knowing where you're supposed to pull the trigger on certain decisions based on that RevPAR happening. You can monitor what RevPAR you have for a future arrival month or arrival date, but he, how you're going to know when you hit that prime demand window to capitalize on the maximum amount of revenue and ADR to pick up to increase the occupancy for your rev part to overall hit is kind of like a gambling thing. So I think that to answer your second part, I think what what is starting to shape is looking at the trends that have some significant change in the last two years. I know that we have a new sense of normalcy that's going to start in, that's emerging already um, in the travel space. I mean, we're seeing we're seeing bookings just continue to stay high right now as far as volume of bookings, number of bookings week over week, where traditionally the January through March type of booking, heavy booking season for vacation rentals has kind of like January to March, and then it starts to tail down a little bit before it hits the summer and goes back up again. But we haven't seen it really dip that much um, for, for a lot of clients. And so what that indicates to me is that what we're seeing and also the other trends is booking windows are getting longer and length of stays within each of those booking window kind of buckets are actually getting longer as well. So that means that people are spending, they're spending more money. Uh, average booking value is up too in a lot of markets for us. Um, average booking value is going up, length of stays going up, and the booking windows themselves are increasing. And so what that means is that people are taking more time to buy their products. So they're looking for quality. They're looking for the right thing because they've had money that they've been saving up or they haven't taken vacations and they're doing it. And so I think the strategies that people should be doing is thinking about uh, incentivizing longer length of stays on the channels if they aren't already, um, creating more flexible cancellation policies if they aren't already, which they should have been doing with COVID uh, going on in, in the time frame, And then also um, start trying to do some, you know, early, early discounts or promotions using some visibility boosters on some of the channels to incentivize, you know, three to six months out bookings because people are looking for those things and they're planning further out and making those happen. So those are, those are the things that I would say that would help increase all fronts, which would be occupancy in the future, increase a better barometer of your rev par if you really want to use that in the, for the future. I hear you. I mean, it's a lot of these metrics are about risk management because at the end of the day, we don't know how many people are looking at any given time and what they're willing to pay. And but we do know that that those that amount of people is changing every day. So for the revenue manager and the distribution specialist, you know, in terms of getting that stuff out and the marketer as well, getting that stuff out to channels is all about risk management. And, um, you know, I, I think probably the right answer for people is is to yeah i would suggest almost differentiate the strategy a little bit so take some of your portfolio you know pick certain units and and position them for occupancy and early booking because you need booking signals to understand what's going to happen in the market and mm -hmm. then take other parts of your property that you or your portfolio depending on how much risk you want to take and say i'm going to really position these for adr i know like like you mentioned in some of the markets that are really opening up um, what we're seeing in the wheelhouse data uh, is, you know, booking windows are really short right now, but but people are actually, you know, the rates are responding really, really quickly. So in the short term, there's a lot of opportunity there, but there's also a lot of risk. So mm -hmm. how can you feel comfortable taking that risk is if you position some 
of your portfolio for occupancy, be a little more conservative on the rate, maybe undercut the market a little bit, take longer term stays, will put you in a position to take those properties where you can take more risk and really push the ADR, you know, push it according to, you know, growing your historicals if you know it's a top property in the market. And then, um, you know, also, I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, when we, we talk about that booking velocity again, right, is uh, know what your cutoff date is. You know, if you have properties and you are trying to reach a certain rev par and you know that, like, you need to get heads in beds at some point, know when you're going to make that decision for each subset of your properties. So maybe it's, mm -hmm. you know, th those ones that you're going to try to push ADR, maybe you're willing to let some nights go. So you're not really going to ever drop that rate cut rate or maybe only drop it back down a little bit. But maybe some of your properties, you know, like, hey, I need to make sure that I get occupancy. So seven or 14 or even 21 days out, I'm really gonna price those competitively and I'll, I'll keep my ADR experiments within a certain time frame. Yeah, I think, I think another really good exercise, it's a little bit, little bit more complex if you're, if you're a larger company because you have so many units to try and figure this out um, and maybe different cost, you know, uh, infrastructures, but, if you have the ability to um, something from my hotel days that the hotels did really well from a revenue management perspective is, is they knew what their cost was, right? So they had a cost per occupied room. So they knew that if I, they occupied a room, it cost, um, for example, a hotel that I, I used to run back in the day um, in downtown Spokane, Washington, uh, cost per occupied room was like $27 and 61 cents. Don't tell me, don't ask me how I know that number still, but that's, that's what it was. And basically from running that property, we knew that, you know, that was our minimum cost to occupy the room. So we knew that our rates in order to try and make a 30% margin had to be X, right? So I would say if there is a possibility, if you know your major cost structures around what it costs you to have a host of booking and have it there, try to use that as, as a way to benchmark kind of what John was just saying with like testing out different strategies, know where your floor is, so to speak. And when I say floor is like the rate doesn't go below a certain amount in order to know what you can play around with and take some calculated risks that probably won't hurt you that bad from, from a cost standpoint. Cause obviously we don't want to host people or take revenue where we're losing money on it all the time, right? Um, now, granted, I know that you know some some folks we kind of had to do that in some aspects here and there because of pandemic. But now that we're starting to come out of it, I think kind of what John's saying is we should be playing with different strategies, but be calculated and smart with it, right? And if you know your cost margins and you know what you can play with or what you're willing to accept, then then play with that and know that you'll have a little more comfort to experiment. If we look at um... I mean, I think that's really interesting, especially when you, you know, I, I in my experience, have talked to. We didn't do it as much uh, in our previous experience, experience in the in the states where we we kept a lot of our costs kind of as fees so that they pass through. But I've seen a number of companies, particularly apart hotels, uh, international companies as well, where those, you know, not only is the choice, but sometimes all those fees have to be wrapped into the rate, and you have to be really cognizant of your cost at that point. Yeah. Um, so, what what is the acronym that that you would call this this cost <laughs> situation <laughs> i think i think we we played with it for a while i don't know if you remember when we were working at stay offer together but we we played with it was like net net cost par i think as we called it cost par so like there's rev par right revenue per available room but then there's cost par right cost per available room so it's or cost cost per occupied room um, so it would need to be something in the sense of trying to figure out, cause there's, there's other components to cost, right? I mean, there's, there's, for some people there's rent for some people there is, I give a 70% split or an 80% or 60% split to the homeowner. Um, the other is, you know, commission costs from the OTAs. There's, you know, other, other kind of fixed costs that you can associate with it that you could at least give kind of, <laughs> what was the terminology we use itself with the Kentucky windage, mm. uh, <laughs> so to speak of <laughs> yeah, that feels about right. At least you can get some of the, I, I, I coined one of our, our former, uh, um, mentors, uh, <laughs> Eric Anderson. He said it was, uh, what did he call it? He called it, uh, uh, Pennsylvania windage or something else. It was a little more, <laughs> a little more refined, a little more educated, but. Uh, but you get the idea is, is, is basically line out some of those, I think. So, yeah. So let's go back to uh, booking velocity um, because it's an interesting thing. I think, I think that people, um, 
we're referring to it as a specific KPI. I know in the work you're doing uh, with the the data intelligence platform you've built at Reynolds United, you're really um, making that a metric. I think people who don't haven't made it a KPI itself uh, would probably understand it and is some kind of pace or something like that. But how how do you think we should be looking at this um, this metric? Um, I think that the metric should be looked at with um not only like I'd said, like kind of like a, a year over year piece, but also look at the peaks and valleys on a chart with the velocity of bookings created in relation to the ADRs that you're getting. If your velocity starts to go down and you notice your ADRs went up, I mean, if you had this kind of, you know, scissor effect where like one goes one way and one goes the other, then you know that one is causing something on the other potentially. So play with it, bring it back down or try to narrow it down to your bedroom types, right? Don't aggregate it necessarily to your entire portfolio or just the market, but try to do it to a bedroom type. Um, whether you have a seven bedroom house or you have a one bedroom apartment or a studio, try to isolate it down to those types of room types and watch what it's doing. And you can make some pretty good educated decisions on the likeliness is what I like to call it, the likeliness of somebody booking your product because of what has actually been booking at certain rates and look at it and see what it, and you have to kind of layer it too a little bit, in my opinion, with some of the booking window, right? Because maybe there's a hot thing coming up that you didn't know about that kind of impedes the integrity of what that velocity is in that moment that might see a peak of like, wow, velocity is way up, ADR is way up. Well, obviously maybe there's an event or something that they booked and then go look at your booking window and where your state dates came for those bookings. And it's like, oh, it was Mardi Gras or whatever it was, you know, that it might be. No, I hear you. I think the cross section of time is it's both the most difficult and most important thing to understand. Because that was always, you know, when we early in the stay offered days, when we were just building like a lot of crazy BI tools to try to figure out like how much money we were even making, because we didn't mm -hmm. know. <laughs> Shocker. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, it was, you know, that was always the problem with revenue pace is a lot of people looking, look at booking value. And they say, this week I made this much money. The problem is you don't know where that money is coming in. And we also know that rates are different in different seasons. So you could be like, oh, this week I made $10,000 and last week I made $10,000. But maybe last week you made $10,000 for the next 30 days. And maybe this week you booked three reservations a year in advance for Mardi Gras. And even though your pace would be like, hey, pace is going great your actual occupancy situation is going to be substantially different based on where that money is falling. And yeah. so dividing these booking velocities up by date ranges, I think, is really going to give you an indicator because you know that your your vacancy uh, in the next, you know, 7, 30, 60 days, that's your expiring stuff. And you got to make sure that that's filling. So you could have a great mm -hmm. booking pace, but if it's not falling in the zones that are expiring, you're, you know, that's lost, lost revenue. It's just all a downhill at that point. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people talk about pace and, and it's because we have these reservation lists and we can, we can actually access the data where we can see it. But, you know, I know the work you're doing at Reynolds United is, is working on this and, and it's something I really believe in too, but how can we really, you know, what are the different ways that we can combine time and pick up uh, I say the word pickup because that's kind of like a hotel term that I, I rest on, yeah. which instead of looking at just dollars, which can be different in seasons, you're looking at room nights. You can identify where they're falling on the calendar. You can visualize them. Um, but that really becomes, is there a way for people to do that right now? Like, you know, if they just have a reservation list and they've been looking at dollar pace, but they want to get a, a different understanding of what they're doing. I mean, yeah, I mean, with the, the product that we built at, at Reynolds United, I mean, we have we have things ranging from, you know, your pickup high level, which shows you kind of like your ISO week creation of bookings and velocity and ADR nights picked up all that good stuff. But then we also have like things like pickup detail to show you like what picked up at what ADR on each individual creation day, but then also show you where it came from. So, I mean, I think what a really valid point here too to bring up is, is uh, it's kind of a compounded one, but it's you know, diversification of eyeballs, right, on your product, right, and knowing where your customer is coming from. So there's there's kind of a three three pronged approach I like to think of this, which is the what, the how, and the why, right. So what what bookings did I get? What what define what those what's are like? You know, what are they? What's their length of stays? What's their ADRs? What is it? 
how are those bookings getting getting there right or what dates for arrival what uh what are they and and how are they how are they coming in are they are they coming from airbnb booking.com are they coming from you know verbo are they coming from direct what's the mix what does that look like and then understand why why are they coming in and maybe there's some demand events maybe there's there was a seo play that your marketing team did or maybe there was an email campaign or some kind of coupon or discount you did i think if you think in those three constructs of like the the what the how and the why i think you can actually diagnose a little bit better about how to focus your time on some of those aspects to know where where you should drive the most i mean if airbnb is hot for you right now because of something that they're doing from a commercial standpoint that pushes your product a lot better or something then you know contemplate what your rate positioning should be for for what's going on and and know that that's that will hopefully spread out your your distribution across different channels or you know capitalize on that that momentum or or whatever it needs to be awesome so we've only got a little bit of time left so uh we'll spend a couple minutes telling you guys about us so that you can get a hold of us because we uh we're both representing really great products to, to help in this exact topic but before we go um Doug, what what is like an experimental or made up KPI that we should be we should we should maybe consider looking at in the space, serious uh, or not? A made up a made up KPI, something that is we should be considering. You know, I don't know. I mean, it's it. You know, distribution is pretty much the heart and soul of what Reynolds United is. But we're we're getting into the revenue, you know, success stuff, trying to actually do it. But I, I would say. Um, listing and distribution health, right? I think that's that's something that that we need to start defining as like a KPI. Like, I mean, some of the channels, as most of you know, like booking.com, they have a quality score for their listings. Uh, Expedia has that as well. And, you know, I've said this for my entire, you know, career in, in the kind of distribution revenue management sector, which has been, you know, it doesn't matter if I set my rates at $100 or $500 or 100 euros or 500 euros, it doesn't matter what I set my rates at. If it's not visible and it's not showing somewhere, it doesn't matter. And we know that a lot of the distribution channels prioritize how they push products based on the quality score, meaning the photo content, the photo resolution, the amount of photos, the amenity tags, what kind of offerings you have, flexible, non-flexible rate plans. I mean, there's a whole component that I think we miss sometimes with, with regards to how we position all the hard work we've decided to put our rates at, where they're actually being visualized out there to people. And it's like, we need a KPI or a, a listing health optimization kind of KPI that says, I'm this quality for my product as it's seen out on multiple, you know, facets of places that people find my product. So, sorry, that winded, long winded there a little bit, but I'd love to hear your, your uh, made up KPI or potential thing that you should be focused on too. Yeah, I'm really interested with like the, uh, all of the, the, the advent of these like automated temperature you know things like i want to know you know my um temperature interaction par i want to know how often people are going to that thermostat and trying to change it and it won't change <laughs> and <laughs> like if it's a, like, like a, a lot we're sending them blankets in a catapult or an amazon drone immediately um just to you know circumvent that potential bad review <laughs> So you're talking about like a nest uh, thermostat that like learns your habits and then yeah. starts to adjust with AI. Nest par. <laughs> I, I want nest par. Nest but par. Yes. <laughs> in all seriousness, though, um, I, I really believe that daily pickup is is a really key KPI. Um, it's a you know, there's a couple ways to to show it so that you can see both what days are picking up and when i think finding metrics that combine the what and the when is really important to revenue decision making yeah, but I totally agree i think i'll focus on nest par first nest par <laughs> um <laughs> so before we hop off today uh doug why don't you tell us a little bit about you and i'll say a little bit about me and and you know just so everyone knows we're absolutely available for contact and we look forward to having an opportunity to chat with y'all Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, and thanks again, John, for having me on this. I love this is this is stuff that you know you and I have, we geek out all the time about, and I love to love We're to real life get friends it, get it recorded. Yeah, we are. We're <laughs> real life friends. Um, but you know, I I would just, I would just say that you know what what I do at Reynolds United and what we're here for to help our current clients as well as potential clients going forward is we we want to help you guys be successful and we want to bring more transparency 
uh, and education to the industry to help people be successful as this new sense of normalcy is de de defining itself as we come out of the, the pandemic. Um, things aren't going to go back to the, exactly the way it was before. Maybe better than the way it was before um, for travel at some point, but it's it's shaping itself and we just all need to be doing a great job of educating. So Reynolds United, it's a connectivity manager uh, for channel management. So at the first and foremost, we, we get you connected to all the channels you potentially want to be on. Um, but then beyond that, we have an amazing team that optimizes and helps you with uh, your, your strategy. Uh, Revenue Success is really invested in trying to help you uh, grow your business and do the right things uh, from either a consultancy aspect or products like Data Studio. Um, we also have uh, amazing other product offerings like a white label uh, licensing. We also have channel management APIs. Um, so we're, we're here to help and we're here to be, be a, a leader uh, in the industry to help people with their distribution and and uh, and eventually with their their revenue management stuff, uh, optimizing it for the channels specifically. So that's me. That's awesome. I'm really excited to be able to to do this with you, Doug, and just talk yeah. shop. Um, it's a lot of fun, and uh, you know, I'm I'm coming from Wheelhouse. We're a uh, dynamic pricing system, um, best in the industry. Maybe been a little quiet, but we have a phenomenal algorithm a great team and we're really trying to make it so revenue managers can efficiently manage their property. We're gonna be able to give them a lot of feedback and data and recommend a rate plan for them completely, uh, but also give you the tools so that revenue managers can intervene and implement their strategies and do the things they need to do in an easy and intuitive way. So, um, I would Reach also add to too that yeah. you guys are, Wheelhouse is an integrated partner with Reynolds United. So if you're a Reynolds United client and you're looking for revenue management uh, yielding software that is that is top notch in the industry, um, I know I may sound biased because we have a partnership here with Wheelhouse, but uh, it's really top of the line. The reactive modeling is is pretty amazing what what Wheelhouse can do. So um, please, you know, reach out to your Reynolds United rep or your Wheelhouse, you know, reach out and and let's get you get you connected and get you started too. Yeah, if you reach out, you'll probably talk directly to me and uh, you'll probably get an opportunity to talk to Doug too. So we'd love to talk about your revenue strategy and um, you know, we'll look forward to uh, coming up with another topic uh, to talk about soon. I kind of think you know, something that's been on my mind, Doug, is I want to talk for 20 minutes with you about like, what do you think is going to happen with Airbnb? What's, what's the mm. future looking for? And, and not just Airbnb, but the other channels. You really have yeah. the in. I have some ideas and I think people would really like to know. I know a lot of people who just distribute through Airbnb and, uh, you know, we probably have some things to say about that. Yeah, I'd love to do that. We should definitely do another episode on that for sure. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. We're still live. I'm going to have it close us out. Okay, cool. But we can dance a little bit. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, though, for the next uh, episode, I think that that could be a good one. And uh, yeah. if anyone has any ideas, they can send them to us. Um, but if you have any ideas, Doug, you know. Yeah, no, I think that would be a good one. I also like the idea of maybe uh, doing another episode on kind of data, right? I mean, it's just, it's just kind of a foundational layer. And I think there's a lot of people in our industry